In 1996, after its software dropped Quake and John Romero, they were looking to go in another direction with their next project, which wasn't always going to be called Quake 2. There were other ideas for the title, like War with an O, but everybody just decided to call it Quake 2, despite the fact that it has nothing to do with the first game. As explained by Tim Willits, id co-owner and designer for, uh, 25 years now, the first Quake game was kind of a mess to develop and so everyone decided to have a clearer vision of what the game should be. Sci-fi, Space Marines. Remember, this was 1997, and the big tough space marine trope hadn't been worn quite as thin. One man fighting against an army of horrible villains. An inspiration cited by the devs was The Guns of Navarone, a movie about a unit of commandos in World War II sent to destroy artillery so that the British Navy could rescue trapped soldiers from the Nazis. I haven't seen it, the movie is older than my parents. He says, after referencing the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in a video about DOS trash, so the story of Quake 2, don't get too excited, there's still barely story in this game, takes its cues from World War II and not H.P. Lovecraft, and from the beginning it was going to be a more focused, polished, impressive game than its predecessor. Which is funny because Quake 2 is probably remembered less fondly. Quake 1 had a certain spirit and atmosphere, certainly helped by Trent Reznor's soundtrack. Trent Reznor was asked to come back and refused after seeing the game itself, saying something I've seen reported as the charitable, this game has no atmosphere. Quake 2 is a turning point for id Software, I think, where the scrappy little company that made deeply influential games became a real company, with like responsible employees, nice dedicated people who lacked the cult of personality that would surround others. Not to mention Tom Hall and John Romero were off at Ion Storm, Sandy Peterson moved on to Ensemble Studios, perfected Human Analog, and Chase Hall asphyxiator John Carr Mac. I would be going to strangle from the rear. I'm a little bit of leverage here. That was the weirdest sensation I've ever had in my whole life. Did you get that on camera? That was awesome, dude. It's a good thing you didn't wet your pants. Carmack did the thing where he made a new engine, or more of an advancement of the previous one that made it a bit more colorful, but he didn't do skeletal animations. What the fuck was he thinking there? Anyway, Adrian Carmack and American McGee were still around, but this was a different id software. Maybe their time had come and gone when it came to truly revolutionizing things. A year later would bring Half-Life, and also Unreal, which was billed as a quake killer when it started, and I think it succeeded. I find it's a better Quake 2 than Quake 2 is. I'm not as familiar with Quake 2, I haven't played it as much as Quake, or Doom, or Doom 3, or probably even Wolfenstein 3D. But I was genuinely curious what playing on the hardest skill would be like. Vanilla Quake 2 doesn't let you select the hardest skill, Skill 3, also known as Hard Plus. Thankfully, Yamaji Quake 2, the port I'm using, calls it Nightmare and lets you select it. This, I feel, helps the game significantly, because I would often get bored around Ammo Depot and drop the game entirely. I've beaten it before. Hell, Quake 2 was the first game I ever deathmatched online in. The deathmatch is superb. I'll remember where the railgun and the edge is until I'm dead. Hard plus it is, because it can't possibly be as degrading as being constantly jibbed by someone named Slim Shady 99 xxx Hard plus is like hard, but the enemies don't flinch, they attack faster, and have more health. Most of the time I didn't even notice, except here. Yeah, fuck that guy. Anyway, I think it's time to start this less than strange journey into id's dark age. That's not to say Quake 2 is a bad game, it isn't. It's exactly what I would expect from every id game that came after it. Until Doom 2016, and then Doom Eternal. Listen, Doom Eternal is so slick and intricate, I can't imagine the company being able to make a game as impressive again. Where Doom 2016 was an evolution of id's formula, Doom Eternal was a redefinition of everything we thought could be done with it. Quake 2 is probably the least that can be done with it. A tactical marvel that is a good action game, a well oiled machine fueled by blood and explosions. And if Quake 2 is the worst game your studio put out, man, that's fine. But Rage is worse. Oh boy, when we get to Rage. Our radio tower up on the hill stopped working. We need someone to fix it. Yeah, probably just out of alignment. You get it fixed for me. I'll give you a shotgun. Good luck. This should be an easy job. Bad, stranger. Oh, can we talk about the soundtrack first? Because it's beautiful. It's not ambient Trent Reznor nightmare fuel, it's hard, fast, wonderful metal. The stuff Bobby Prince wanted to do, except now they can put it on a CD and play it in-game. It's so good. It was made by Sonic Mayhem, which is a person whose name is I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that.
It's one of those soundtracks you can pop into your CD player, a thing we used to do, and listen to it without the game. Absolutely shreds. Adds so much to the action. <laughs> The basic story of Quake 2 is that you are Bitterman. Look at that, a named protagonist. And your pod crashes onto Strogos, planet of the Strogs, a sinister race of aliens that fuses human or alien tissue with metal like the Borg, but bloodier and more savage, and with explosions. And only one of these monsters has a shield. Your main objective, out of all the other ones that gently nag at you throughout the game, is to destroy the big gun. After you've made your way through military installations, the city, other military installations, the palace, Quake 2 doesn't have a lot of variety in its settings. It does what it can with them. In terms of level design, it has sort of a Hexen-like hub system that lets you travel back and forth between areas. It's not used extensively for anything important. You go to this map and then complete an objective that opens up an area on the previous map. Go there, and by the time you're done, you might not even know you've completed the mission because everything you need to do is fairly obvious. Maybe I've played it too much, but the objectives seem to complete the themselves while you're battling the Strogue. It's never confusing, which I guess is a testament to the level designers, seasoned pros by this point. The first hub starts off as soon as you crash and escape your pod. Here you are, armed with only a shitty little blaster, shooting the common low-level hit scanners for like a minute until you go over here and get the shotgun. It's not a bad shotgun, I always liked the look of it, even if it felt a little weak. The game teaches you that there's breakable glass now, you can crouch, there's gonna be a robot voice telling you Every time your mission status changes, you know immediately that this isn't Quake 1. And if you were lucky enough to have one of those fancy 3D accelerator cards at the time, it wasn't gonna look like Quake 1 either. Even in software mode, the new lighting and particle effects were pretty impressive. Quake 2 RTX is kind of trash, though. It runs badly and ruins the atmosphere that Trent Reznor said that this game doesn't have. Default settings make everything really bright, and when you turn that down, you still have to deal with texture bugs, and what the fuck did they do to my railgun? It's all very shiny and suffers from adding HD textures to a game that wasn't designed for them. At least it doesn't cost anything. Another new thing is an inventory system. The first inventory item you'll pick up is a silencer. The game has useful power-ups, too. Quad damage and vulnerability, a toxin suit, which is useful in about three places throughout the whole game, a power shield, too, and I think that's it. Yeah, I save the power-ups for when I need them, mostly for cheesing bosses. It's too bad that you don't get nearly the number of quad damage power-ups as you do in Quake 1. Rampages are a lot less frequent. I had maybe one or two during the whole game, and it seems like a complete non-factor. Like it was in Doom 2016, where you just pick up a few during the whole campaign. <laughs> Quake 2 does have an atmosphere, a foreboding sci-fi body horror thing going on. Space Nazis made of flesh and metal to keep the guns and Navarone influences. The enemies may not flinch, but they still do this thing where they continue attacking as they die, which you can avoid by jibbing them. They all jib. They all jib. It's actually pretty cool. You're moving along through this base shooting Strog, who won't give you much trouble until the Enforcers. Chain Gunners? Fun! Slightly less of a problem when you get the machine gun in the next level, which has recoil for some reason. What game do you think you are, Quake 2? Cut that shit out. It's still satisfying, because the game gives it to you super early and lets you mow down the lower enemies with it. <laughs> But that's not what we're here for. We have to go to the secret level once you get through the sewer. 
have a swim, go down this elevator, and your objective changes from go to a thing loosely related to saving humanity to find a powerful weapon. And oh boy, do you ever. Quake 2 Super Shotgun lives up to the family legacy. It's pump action now. It sounds just as devastating as the Doom 2 Super Shotgun. This should clarify that the weapons in this game are not a problem. I mean, they don't have any muzzle flashes for some goddamn reason, but whatever, I guess. You'll pick up throwable grenades, too, which I don't really use. I like to save them until I get the grenade launcher. In hard plus mode, you'll meet the two most dangerous enemies in the game in the first hub. Oh, this one always weirded me out. It'll suck your health dry with... Uh... And the Gunner, who really only becomes a huge problem on Hard Plus because he attacks faster, and I don't know if he's gonna spam me with machine gun fire or grenades. Early game, you might benefit from crouching under the grenades if you're close enough. I really prefer getting the rocket launcher or railgun to deal with them. Before that, you have the super shotgun. I'd like to point out that none of this is bad design, it checks all the boxes. Your enemies all make distinct sounds and movements that provide proper feedback to the player. You walk into a room, you hear something, you know what's coming. Oh yeah, the berserkers are like kittens, they're mostly harmless. Their attack wind-up takes so long that it's your own fault if you get hit. You beat a few other monsters in the first hub, the flyers, the barracuda sharks, easily dealt with with the super shotgun. I don't think any of the monsters besides the gunner or the parasite actually annoy me. They're not too difficult to deal with. The enemies have some really cool idle animations, too. Be really hard to see them in-game with all the shooting, though. What's your name, scumbag? Trespasser! Did your parents have any children that lived? Oh shit, wait, that is a dead guy. You know what, never mind. You remember when I said I usually stop playing this game around Ammo Depot because I get bored? Well, second hub starts with Ammo Depot, and I'm trying to remember why. <laughs> you get the chain gun around here, and that's fun, even if it chews through your ammo. Maybe because it chews through your ammo. I don't remember an FPS game before this that lets you spit so much lead at an enemy at once. It's kind of amazing, even if it is impractical, but sometimes, just every now and then, you run into a room and jib everything in it by firing 200 bullets in about five seconds. It's pretty satisfying. It's always around here that the game starts to lose me, but why? Is it that I've already dealt with its most difficult challenges? The game doesn't think so. For some reason, the game thinks that these tanks are a problem, even though I can spam the chain gun at them and avoid any rockets or energy blasts. The first boss would be better served with the tank name, I mean, look at it. Talking about single segments of Quake 2 isn't really that exciting, where in other games you have specific levels and areas where you can consider high points. Quake 2 feels like it maintains a certain consistency all the way through. It's never bad, but also very little stands out. So let's talk about the rest of the guns, because they're great. The grenade launcher, I think it feels better than Quake or Quake 3's grenade launcher. The rocket launcher, not quite as good as Quake 1's, but it's fine. The hyper blaster has a wind-up for some goddamn reason, but I find it's a good replacement for the machine gun anyway. It's your standard rapid-fire energy weapon. The railgun? Perfection. Shadow Warrior may have had one first, but Quake 2 had it best. Quake 3 added a sound cue to help the player know when it was ready to fire again, which is cool, otherwise it seems like railguns may have peaked with the Quake series. And the BFG-10K. Y'all know what it is and what it does. The first real attempt to upgrade the classic BFG to make it not based on hacked-together Doom Engine nonsense? It's a big green ball that now also shoots lasers to nearby targets as it passes by. So now you've got what I call the id arsenal. The formula that id games would more or less follow until like Doom 2016, give or take a super shotgun or a railgun here and there. Pistol, shotgun, super shotgun, light automatic weapon, heavy automatic weapon, rocket launcher, rapid fire energy pew pew gun. Quake 3 has two of those. Railgun, BFG. It's the way it goes. It's like a brand, an id brand. I guess that's what sticks with me most and why Quake 2 sometimes leaves a sour taste in my mouth. It became a brand. 
And while there was a little wiggle room when it came to the formula, Doom 3 is scary. Rage has three side quests. It feels like there wasn't any room for anything game-changing anymore if it wasn't the technology. And that technology led to games taking longer and longer to make. Doom 3 took four years, Rage took seven. Its software is, and will probably forever be, Tech Wizards. I wanted to go into this like other pro videos. Here are the enemies, here are the weapons, here's how these work together, but you already know. There's a few secret levels to find. Sudden Death is actually pretty unique. If you can jump up past this waterfall and receiving center, you'll be taken straight to Sudden Death to collect as many power-ups and weapons as you can in the small amount of time it gives you. The third secret level, much closer to the end, is a low-gravity space station full of flying enemies. It sure is that. I didn't hate playing Quake 2 again, but if you were to ask me what parts I specifically remember, I couldn't tell you much. There was a mind full of mutants, Three bosses, they never caused me much trouble and it would be hard for me to really differentiate between them. Tank thing, flying thing, and the final boss had a BFG in two forms. I played through Quake 2, took me about six hours minus the time I spent taking notes, which going over them again couldn't have been very long. Hyper Blaster is chain gun, but accurate. Good long range weapons are not available early game. Soundtrack is A+. Unaware Strog are easier to kill. Make sure to pronounce Strog as Strog, because someone will bitch about it in the comments. Fuck the torture chambers. This level always gives me trouble. Hardest map in the game as far as I'm concerned, even when you meet the Iron Maidens. They can be dealt with quickly, a couple rockets or a couple railgun shots. But these menacing hallways even include a mini sewer section, with a parasite in it, as if they predicted that 23 years later some asshole would come along and use it for a dumb gag I can't escape. If I stop doing it, the joke falls apart because it relies on me being petty enough to count every single one, every time. I guess things liven up when you get towards the big gun, and that map with the airstrike is cool. I have to disable the supply train that the Strogue are using. I don't know what's on that train or why it's important, it doesn't matter. The mission objectives of Quake 2 are effective at conveying a certain scope of the human operations on Strogos. You are the one-man army. No one else can get to the surface until we destroy the big gun. And to do that, we have to complete all these secondary objectives. I'm not entirely sure how this war started in the first place. There's a little bit in the intro that explains that we were attacked. The intro has what sounds like news reports explaining that the Strogue attacked major cities and that our brave heroes were taking the fight to them. Not a bad setup. Make the alien bastards pay. The kind of righteous bloodshed that's expressed in a paragraph in the Doom and Quake manuals as an excuse to kill everything that moves. These cutscenes are a new feature of Quake 2, and I don't think they help it. A radio voice gives you objectives, and between units, a computer screen with a similarly robotic voice shows you a map and tells you what you'll be doing later. Initiate scan. Acquiring. Acquired. Personnel located. Now exiting base area. Proceed to bunker area. Destroy Strahd logistical train. I'm sorry, the what? Strahd logistical train. The Strahd? As these brave soldiers took the fight to the Strogs home planet. The Strog? I can't win, I give up. Calling this game story-driven is like calling Jurassic Park science-driven. This is still the flea circus. Adding further context to it only raises more questions. Yeah, I'm working on it. But that's what the whole fucking game is about, it's about the big gun! What? It just feels like another sewer, another maze of pipes, ramps, and metal. <sighs> oh, 
Oh. Oh, God. Oh, God, please, no. Don't do the dope fish dirty like this. Not like this. Towards the end, as you're headed into the palace, you find the tank commanders, who were upgraded versions of the tanks from earlier, who are obviously big bastards who take a lot of your ammo to deal with. The tank commanders are like the elite guards of the Strog, and then it's at the end of this palace level where this happens. I'm having an interaction with another character that isn't just a staticky voice on the other end of the radio saying vague army man things at me. You'd think getting here would be difficult, and it is, occasionally. Especially if you have one of those source ports where the crosshairs are big, blocky, ugly things that hurt my eyes. Fucking disgusting. But this game isn't made to be a dick to you. It doesn't have spawns or arch files. Nothing blinds you or outmaneuvers you or really challenges you that much. Not even the Strog leader. I'm invulnerable for half the fight, and for the other half, I can just run circles around him. I guess it's better than any of the boss fights in Quake 1 because it's a boss fight, and most of the Doom ones now that I think about it. This bit at the end with the animation, the torso trying to reattach to the legs, is cool and memorable. And I feel like the rest of the game rarely lives up to this. The player is guided through Quake 2 without much resistance. The game just wants you to dive in and have fun, and dying isn't very fun. One of the things I noticed when playing a little of the first Quake 2 expansion by Zatrix was that it was considerably more difficult than the main campaign. This is true of most expansion packs, but the important part is why. You're thrown into a sewer level pretty early. And something that Vanilla Quake 2 never really prepared you for was an abundance of rudely placed hit scanners. Its software is made up of professionals who make very deliberate design choices. Zatrix, who up to this point had worked on Redneck Rampage, didn't care about the player's feelings. <laughs> For fuck's sake, these introductory enemies, whatever they are, leap around like the mutants and take a solid three to five shells to bring down. Id Software, at least in Quake 2, wanted to keep the power fantasy, but like a lot of developers, lost the idea that the fantasy only works if you overcome something, not if you feel like you're operating the machine properly. The other thing that sticks out in my mind of Quake 2 probably more than anything else is the secret developer's room. It is a cool easter egg and I really like it, but there's more here. What was happening at id Software during this, besides the public bitchiness towards Ion Storm and Romero and Dai Katana? The story to this, of course, is hinted at in Masters of Doom down to the Easter Egg Room designed by Tim Willits himself. Each portrait triggered some type of animation that, in Tim's mind, reflected the personality of the staffer. Carmax disappeared into the floor when anyone approached. Carmack had disappeared, locking himself away in coding, and within a year, artist Adrian Carmack, no relation, would want out of its software, feeling that the company was just making the same game over and over again. American McGee and Adrian Carmack would be gone soon enough, McGee getting the same treatment Romero and Tom Hall got, for the most part, and when you hit Carmack's button... No, no, John, John, what are you doing? No, let me out. Make it stop. Make it stop. Make it stop. Yeah, I know there's a self-destruct happening and the station's about to explode, but that doesn't matter. It's the end of the game and Bitterman survives. Quake 2 runs and plays like one of Carmack's Ferraris. Impressive, pretty, and powerful. But there's only so much a car can offer you if you've got a tiny penis.